All right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do 50-plus live, free, interactive broadcasts every single month. And if you head to our website on the bottom of the screen, you'll see all that we have to offer coming up. You can register for our newsletter and get it right in your inbox. Very cool stuff. Now, today is special because today marks day two of our Week of Wonder. We are joining forces with the Canadian Association of Science Centers, all those amazing facilities coast to coast to coast that help make the world a little bit more understandable. They showcase the cosmos, they showcase the oceans, all these topics that are of huge interest to communities and schools around the globe. Science centers are the chief conduits for making that connection. And today we are going to my favorite place in Canada. Okay, I've been all over this country. It's been, I'm, I'm very privileged to have had the chance to go to every province and up to the territories. There is no better place than Newfoundland. Newfoundland is my favorite place to go. Petty Harbor particularly, where we're joining uh, live from today, I had one of the most amazing whale watching experiences of my life. So I encourage you all as science centers are opening up across the country, go, go to science centers, go inside and better yet, go to the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium. They've got some really great stuff going on as you're gonna see today. Also today, we are diving in on a topic that we almost never cover here as an organization, and that is ocean acidification. So we talk about climate change a lot, we talk about that it affects things on land a lot, biodiversity loss. Ocean acidification is one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. It's one that a lot of kids don't know, and so I'm so excited to dive in with Holly at the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium to explore this topic, do a live experiment, do a bit of a walkthrough, and learn more about their amazing facility. Let's get ready, buckle up, and I'm going to turn it over to Holly to blow our minds. Holly, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Hello. So like Jesse said, my name is Holly, and I, of course, am with the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium. Um, so today we're going to be doing our DJ Ocean Drop the Base presentation. Um, so it involves me explaining what ocean acidification is. We'll do a really, really cool experiment. And also, I'm going to take you through the aquarium to actually show you some of the animal ambassadors that we have here at the moment. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, us and who we are as a very proud member of the Canadian Association for Science Centers uh, and what we do here at our center. So for those of you who may have never heard of us before, uh, we are a small, as our name suggests, we are a mini aquarium on the east coast of Newfoundland, just 15 or 20 minutes south of Newfoundland's capital city, St. John's. Uh, we are called a mini aquarium, not only for the size of our facility and our staff, um, but also because of the size of our animals that we house. Uh, so all of our animals here are uh, under one meter in length, pretty much. You can fit most of them in the palm of your hands. Uh, and they're all local to our waters here in Newfoundland. And uh, so our facility is a catch and release aquarium, uh, meaning we collect all of our animals every year and then release those animals back to the ocean at the end of our summer season, uh, which is really exciting, not only because the animals are returned home, uh, but because we're constantly getting new animals every year and we don't really know what we're gonna get. So there on the screen are a few examples of animals that we usually will get most years. Um, very common is uh, jellyfish and things like hermit crabs and really small invertebrates like sea stars. And um, that one there in the corner is a scary big wolfish. <laughs> He's got big teeth. Um, but then at the end of the summer, like I said, they go back to their ocean home. We have an excellent team of divers that help us collect up our animals. And uh, we actually keep track of exactly what location they were collected from. So we know that we're bringing them back to the right place when they go home again. Um, and our volunteer divers and snorkelers will help us do that. And so those images are actually of our release party, uh, which we usually would do at the end of our summer season. Um, and it is a really wonderful model that we've had here. Um, and we've been here since 2013, uh, making us the second catch and release mini aquarium in Canada, second after the Euclid mini aquarium uh, over in BC, who were actually modeled after. Uh, so our founder, Melanie Knight, um, she visited that aquarium and was so inspired that she decided to take that mini aquarium all the way to the opposite coast of the country. Uh, and we're so happy that she did. Petty Harbor is such a perfect little fishing community. Uh, our building is actually the old cod processing plant before the cod fishery halted in 1992. Uh, this was actually the old plant. So the images that you're seeing right now, that's the uh, Euclid Aquarium that we're modeled after. Um, so they started off as just that small little shed and they actually expanded into this awesome facility. There's us right there. So our founder is Melanie Knight there. She did an awesome TED talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, she uh, she brought that aquarium model 
all the way over here to Petty Harbor, which is awesome. And our building is also very unique because it's a flow through system. Uh, so you can flip back to the other screen. There we go. Uh, that is our aquarium lifeline water system. And it's really, really cool because all of the uh, water that we have in the aquarium at once, um, it's being pumped directly from the ocean outside and drains back. And it's like a constant cycle of water. Um, so it's 946 liters of water per minute. Um, it's a big system. It's a really, really cool uh, model that we have here. And uh, that means that all of the animals that are in the aquarium are actually getting that natural water coming straight from the ocean outside where they came from. So that water is coming in and constantly being cycled out for them. Uh, let's see here. We do a lot of programming. Um, so like I said, uh, we are a catch and release aquarium. So we do still have all of our animals right now, but they're going to be released really, really soon. And so when our animals are released in the winter, uh, when we're closed to the public um, here on site, we actually go out to different groups and do um, education presentations and do a little bit um, of programming over the winter and the spring, even though we're closed. And so uh, today we're gonna be doing, of course, a program all about ocean acidification. Uh, so let's start off by answering the question, what is ocean acidification? Uh, well, the short and very simple answer to that is that it's the process of our oceans becoming more acidic. But what does that even mean and how is it happening? So let's tackle what does it mean? Uh, so in order to understand what an acid is and to understand what it means to become more acidic, you have to understand this pH scale right here. So a pH scale is just a measurement scale from 0 to 14 to indicate how acidic or basic something is. And a base, of course, is the, the opposite of an acid. So the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. So when you're there at zero, one, when you're looking at acids, stomach acid, lipids, all that kind of stuff is really acidic. So it's really low on the scale. But then when you go up towards the other end of the scale, like drain cleaner and bleach, that's all really basic. So it's the opposite of an acid. And uh, you may have heard about this when talking about like um, swimming pools. And when you hear the word pH, um, I think a lot of people associate it with swimming pools because you actually have to balance the chemicals really well in order to keep your swimming pool clean and a proper pH. Um, and when you're looking at that scale again, can we just go back right to that scale? If you're looking at where water is, it's right in the middle. So that's neutral. So we've got acids and then we've got right in the middle is neutral. And then of course we have bases and the ocean is actually slightly basic. Uh, so the pH of seawater is around 8.1. So right there in the middle, it is pretty neutral, but it's leaning more towards basic. And so when we say our oceans are becoming more acidic, what we're kind of meaning is that it's leaning more towards neutral, um, but that is still a problem. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, let's take a look at how it's happening. So we can go back over to that other picture. There we go. Um, so when we say ocean acidification, it kind of sounds a little bit scary, but it's all um, kind of connected to what we are already familiar with, which is um, the warming of the globe and kind of climate change and things like that. Um, so when you look at our atmosphere, we have an increase of carbon dioxide. And that, of course, actually gets absorbed into the ocean. The ocean absorbs 30 to 40 percent of all the carbon that's released out in the uh, atmosphere. So it's actually quite a large carbon sink that'll absorb up a lot of that carbon from our atmosphere, which at first you might think that's a good thing because it's getting it out of our atmosphere, um, but it's actually a bad thing for the marine environment, just as it is in our environment up, you know, not in the ocean. So the increase in carbon dioxide comes from things like fossil fuels and uh, like gas emissions from cars, and other sources like natural gas and oil and coal and all those sorts of things will contribute to higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in order to show you guys how this works, we're actually gonna be doing our experiment. So, I am going to just show you guys here, just a second. I'm gonna flip my camera around. We'll go to the Flip my camera around. There we go. 
So this is our experiment set up right here. This is everything that you need to do this experiment. Uh, we of course need this right here is white vinegar. Uh, we need baking soda. This in this jug right here is seawater. Uh, we'll also need this right here. And if you're doing this at home, there are alternatives that you can use. This is a universal indicator. So this uh, indicates the pH of whatever you put it in. Um, but you can also use things like, I think you can boil cabbage and use cabbage juice. There's a few different things that you can use, but if you can have this, you can actually buy this from the pet store. So when you're looking at the pH of your fish tank, uh, you can get that at the pet store actually. Uh, we've got a few spoons and jars and tape and things like that you're going to need. So what we're going to do first, I'm actually gonna set you back up on this tripod here so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. And I'm going to flip the camera back around. There we go. Can we all see that? All right. We sure can. Looks great. Awesome. All right. So what we're going to do first is we have these clear jars right here. And we are going to put our seawater in those jars. So one jar is going to be our experiment jar. And the other jar is what we call a control jar. So we're not going to be doing anything to the jar. It's just going to be there to be used as comparison. So when the experimental jar hopefully changes and you can see the effects of the experiment, you can be able to, uh, you'll compare it to the control jar to see how different it actually is. So what we're going to be doing is adding this indicator to our seawater so that we can visually see the change in the pH. So this indicator, like I said, will show you the pH of the water. So we're going to put a bit in each jar. And give it a little stir. This one right here, our experimental, needs a little bit more indicator, I think. All right, I'm gonna move that out of the way. So if we take a look at our pH and the indicator color, you'll be able to see that it's kind of like a teal blue so in between a green and a blue. So that means that it is right around 8.1. So right in between seven and eight here, you can see it's more on the blue side. So that is the normal pH of seawater. So for our experimental jar right here, we're actually gonna take a smaller little container and tape it to the inside of the jar. So I'm gonna get a little bit of tape right here. And we are just going to put it there at the top and tape it onto the side. There we go, maybe a little bit higher up here. All right. So in this experimental jar right here, we're gonna do a chemical reaction inside this smaller container that I just taped onto the jar. And that chemical reaction is going to be between vinegar and baking soda because this is a chemical reaction that will release carbon dioxide. So much like in our atmosphere, carbon dioxide is being released. It's going to be released from this jar here. The gas, so the carbon dioxide is going to come out of the jar. We're going to put a lid on top to keep all of the gases inside. And you'll be able to see as the seawater absorbs the carbon dioxide, It'll hopefully be able to change color enough so you guys can see it on camera. But of course you guys always can do this at home if it's not the easiest to see on camera, but hopefully it'll change enough so that we can see. And we wanna make sure that there is enough of a gap between our container and the lid so that the gases can go from the small little container into the larger container. I think I need a new piece of tape. 
so that it can be absorbed by the seawater. So let's just put another piece of tape on here. I think my jar might be a little wet, that's why. Always make sure that your experimental setup is dry because you need the tape to stick on there. Let's try one more piece of tape. There we go, much better. All right, so I've already poured out a bit of baking soda here onto this tray to make it a little bit easier for me to pour it in. So I'm just gonna grab a spoon and put a bit of baking soda into that experiment container. There we go. And I've also poured out my vinegar to make that a little bit easier to pour. And I don't want this jar to fall into the water, of course. I might need one more piece of tape. Oh my goodness. There we go. And we need to be quick with our lid to make sure that none of the gases escape. So we're going to lid that and we're going to lid our control as well. There we go. And this also happens over time. So we'll check back in on our experiment after we come back out of the aquarium to see if anything has changed even further. So as our experimental setup is just moving right along right there, we're actually going to be doing another demonstration. But first, I'm going to explain to you guys how it works. So basically, we're going to answer the question now, why do we care? <laughs> why, what changes um, will this make in the ocean environment? And how does it actually affect the animal? So I'm actually going to get Jesse to throw up one of those, uh, that last slide from that presentation so you guys can see a little bit better as to what I'm talking about. So the next slide there, so right there. So we have, of course, we already know that dissolved carbon dioxide in the water makes carbonic acid. So that's how the ocean is actually becoming more acidic because of that increase in carbon dioxide. And there's a little bit more to that chemical equation than just making the acid. That acid can then break down into something called a bicarbonate ion and a hydrogen ion. And the problem there is the hydrogen ion can um, combine with a carbonate ion to make even more bicarbonate. And bicarbonate isn't exactly um, the problem. That's not uh, what we're too concerned about. What we're concerned about is that the carbonate ion is being used up to make the bicarbonate. And the carbonate ion is actually what animals need to form hard shells. So when you're talking about animals like snails or crabs uh, or corals, all of these animals that have a hard calcified shell, they actually form their shells using the carbonate that's already dissolved in the water. And the more hydrogen ions there are, the less carbonate there is for the animals to use to harden their shells. <clears throat> so, and not only does ocean acidification make it harder for animals to form their shells, it also affects existing shells due to how acidic the water is. So shells and other calcium carbonate structures like corals will begin to dissolve in extreme conditions. And to demonstrate this, we're actually going to be putting a mussel shell inside vinegar, so a strong acid and we'll see what the acid does to the vinegar shell. So right here, we've got a jar and we've got this mussel shell and we're going to just pour some vinegar into this container here. 
and drop our mussel shell into the vinegar and see what happens. So it doesn't happen very quickly, but basically what will start to happen is there will start being gases released. So bubbles will come up out of that mussel shell. So do you guys see those small little bubbles starting to come right from the most narrow part of that shell right there on the right? So yeah. that shell. You sure do, yeah. There we go. So that shell is going to slowly dissolve in this acid. And so as time goes on, more and more bubbles will begin to form. And of course, this is an extreme condition. So this shell is in just pure white vinegar. So it's not like, you know, in a few years time, all of our snails and crabs are going to start dissolving. But it does, of course, affect them and how they can make their shells and the shell that they already do have. And um, this might be a little grim, or you might say, well, what can I do to try to help and, uh, you know, make it such that ocean acidification won't be harming our animals, or at least try to minimize the effect of ocean acidification. And there's actually a lot that we can do because um, when we talk about climate change and the things that we can do to minimize our carbon footprint, um, it's the exact same for ocean acidification. So it's all to do with the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. So things like taking your bike instead of your car or carpooling or taking the bus, you know, cutting down on your emissions that way uh, will definitely minimize the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can shop local. So not only are you supporting your neighbors and small businesses, but it minimizes the need for excessive packaging and shipping, which all requires energy and more emissions. Um, you can reduce your consumption, you can reuse what you can or recycle what you can, um, because that all will cut down on production and, of course, uh, the need for um, the production of materials and moving of materials. And you can also plant trees. So you can help uptake the carbon that's already been out there. You can plant more trees because, of course, as you know, um, trees will take carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen. So not only can you uh, minimize how much carbon gets out into the atmosphere, but you can also help correct the problem as well by planting more trees. And because we're all a little bit more familiar with what we can do to help climate change, uh, like I said, ocean, acidica uh, ocean acidification is caused by the exact same thing. So more uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you're kind of uh, helping both issues simultaneously um, by doing these, these different things to help cut down on your carbon emissions. So with that, I'm actually going to be bringing you guys into the aquarium now, and then we can check back in on our experiments at the very end. So right now I'm actually set up in our lobby and we are closed for the season right now. So I'm the only one in the aquarium. Let's just take a look. As you're going to explore, I'll just note we've got a whole bunch of folks joining on YouTube. we got some families in Pr uh, Grand Prairie. If you guys want to let me know where you're joining from on YouTube, we'd love to give you a shout out when we'll dive in. But yeah, we're standing at the threshold. I won't keep you any longer, Holly. Go, take us in. <laughs> All right. So we'll just do a quick little look at our aquarium here. We have a few animals. So this one right here, this is a lumpfish. And so lumpfish are affected. Oops. There we go. Am I back? <laughs> All right, so ocean acidification affects lumpfish as it does with most of the animals that don't necessarily have a hard shell, but they're affected because they have to expend more energy just to metabolize or to regulate themselves in a changing environment. And these fish, as you can see, he's not a great swimmer. They are called a lumpfish for a reason. He's a little bit of a lump and they have that little sucker right there on the bottom. So instead of swimming around and expending a bunch of energy, these fish actually like to just stick onto rocks using that sucker. And we also have an anemone right here in the corner. And you may know if you've seen Finding Nemo, they actually have a relationship with clownfish and clownfish are one of the fish that are really affected by ocean acidification um, because there's been a few studies done that shows that it affects their homing ability. And a homing ability is the ability for young fish to be able to find a their home reef. And of course they will live in these anemones as well. And it all has to do with the pH of the water. So 
these anemones are quite cool. We're going to move back toward back of the aquarium because that's actually where our touch tanks are. And we can get a little bit up close and personal with some smaller animals. We actually do have cod, though. They're really, really cool swimming around in the tank here. There's one right up there. They are just so cool. But let's take a look at our touch tank. So in here, we do have a lot of hermit crabs. And they are the perfect example when you're talking about ocean acidification, because not only do they need to harden their own shell, so the hard shell that you see on the claws and the legs, it's called their exoskeleton, they also need this hard shell right here. And this shell is actually a snail's shell. So the hermit crab is not the animal that creates that shell. They actually just borrow it from snails. So snails are the one that make the shell. And then when the snail is all done with it, the hermit crab will move in and take over. And they're actually quite shy. You can see he's kind of hiding away in that shell. But usually when you put them right back in the water, they'll come back out. We also have sea urchins. And they are these really hard, spiky animals. So of course they use calcium carbonate to make their shell. And so they would be competing with all of those hydrogen ions for their carbonate. And they can grow and grow and grow that shell. So they're constantly needing that carbonate out of the water to make that hard shell. Over here, we have a few more hard shell creatures. We have a scallop right here. We have some smaller hermit crabs. And yeah, so while I'm here in the aquarium, if you wanted to open it up to questions, Jesse, we can start answering some questions. Sure thing. Well, first of all, thank you so much for walking us around. What a beautiful, beautiful place. And again, when they're open, there's so much more to discover too. So hopefully we'll get that chance to go in person in the not too distant future. Uh, we've got groups joining us on YouTube. We've got our live classes. So we're going to dive in with questions, whether you want to know about the animals, whether you want to know about the aquarium, some of those cool experiments that Holly did earlier. Uh, no matter what, you're good to go. And we are going to kick it off with Miss Kingston's class. They're joining us in here, Amici, uh, New Brunswick. Come on in, unmute your mic, and uh, come on in with that enthusiasm, guys. Welcome in. Hey. Hey, ben. ben has a question. Nice and loud, Ben. Do you have any clownfish? I can't see you. Do we have any clownfish in our aquarium? Yeah. So, unfortunately, we do not have clownfish, but we do have their houses. We have a bunch of anemones. So like I said, all of our animals here at the aquarium are local species and our waters are just a little too cold for clownfish, but we do have a bunch of cold water anemones. Very cool guys. One of the things you mentioned that you do have that I absolutely love is this jellyfish thing. I know when I went to Newfoundland, I saw them right on the coast and it blew my mind. I truly had no idea we had jellyfish that far north when I went a few years ago for the first time. So keep those animal questions coming. We already have a few on YouTube as well. All right, St. John Catholic, if you guys want to come on in, uh, joining us in uh, Perth, Ontario, come on in and uh, take us away with a question. Thank you, Mike, and you're good to go. Fantastic. How do we contribute to ocean acidification with things other than fossil fuels and greenhouse gases? So is that how could we minimize? Yeah, sorry, could you repeat the question a little louder? Sorry, guys. How do we contribute to ocean acidification with things other than fossil fuels and greenhouse gases? Anything else uh, other than fossil fuels? Holly? I'm sorry, it's cutting out just a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. the first part of the question. No worries at all. The question is, other than fossil fuels, is there anything else that we're doing as humanity to contribute to ocean acidification or is it just the fact that we're putting carbon into the atmosphere? So the uptake of carbon into the atmosphere is the main cause of ocean acidification. Um, but there's also other factors like deforestation. So like I said, the trees will absorb the carbon as well. So if there's more trees to absorb the carbon, um, that's less for the ocean to take up. So that's another factor as well, but it all has to do with that carbon dioxide. Right. Just like some of you guys might know the water cycle, there's a carbon cycle as well. So whether you're contributing to the problem or you're reducing the impact of or the ability of the earth to counteract that problem itself, 
Either way is bad. I did want to highlight, we're really early on in this broadcast. Literally yesterday, there was a fantastic paper by Oxford University scientists talking about the fact, literally, if we just continued with the exact current trend of how we're unveiling renewable energy sources like solar, wind, and more, the exact current trend that we've got now, in about 25 years, we'll have the capacity to have net zero emissions on a world scale, which is really exciting. It's one of the most positive stories uh, to come out of the climate sector in years. And so for our teachers, I really encourage you to check that out. And if you email us after the broadcast, I can get you a link to the sort of summation of that paper so great question guys Yusuf now we've got a family joining at home in Mississauga if you guys have a question just turn on your camera let me know and I'll come to you uh, but what I want to do right now is go to Grand Prairie Alberta from Miss Lebrex group they want to know have you seen any evidence some species are adapting to the changing water great question that is an awesome question and it's a question that we don't really fully have the answer to yet um, like we kind of touched on, climate change and how it affects us on land and the atmosphere is a lot more well understood than the effects in the ocean. So it's actually quite a new area of study. So hopefully more studies will be done and things will be found out kind of in that realm. Um, but it's all really new right now. Yeah. One of the things that's really cool, some of the most cutting edge research we featured in the world, uh, in Australia, in Indonesia, are people working to breed corals that are more resilient to acidic waters. So we're literally trying to breed like super coral that we can then implant back in, the earth in coral beds that will be more resilient to climate change. So it's something that we can help speed up, but naturally, that's one of the big problems with climate change and our, the biodiversity loss in the world, is that it's happening at a speed that is way faster than most of you just can adapt to naturally. It's like a thousand times faster than the base rate. Um, and so it's really difficult for, for animals to adapt to that. Great question, guys. All right, we're gonna take a few more quick YouTube questions and we'll come back to Miss Kingston's. So, um, <laughs> Miss Brenna's class in Guelph wants to know, if a snail gives up its shell for a hermit crab, does it become a slug? What do we think? <laughs> So, no, that's not exactly how it works. So when a snail, of course, reaches the end of their life cycle, the, the, what they're, what's called their foot, their really slimy part. Actually, I have an awesome animal right here to show you guys when talking about snails and shells in their slimy foot. This right here is a moon snail, and he's massive. So that is my hand for scale. So he's bigger than my hand. And so those snails, that slimy part, after they die is going to be eaten or, you know, dissolve or just, you know, break down. But that hard shell, that gets left over. So that is there for the taking for those hermit crabs. And so, of course, snails can't live forever. The snail does die, but this, the shell will stay around for a long time. Very, very cool. So nice to have a lot of animals on camera. I want to put up a, a name of a YouTube video. When you're done this broadcast, everybody, I know we're talking about ocean acidification and it's a super important topic. Check out Crabs Trade Shells in the Strangest Way. This is from Life Story, a BBC series. It is the most wild video you will ever see in natural history ever. It's so, so cool. So if you're interested in hermit crabs, we've got a chance to see some of those today. Check out that video. It will absolutely blow your mind. Yusuf, uh, we've got a family joining us in Mississauga. If you guys want to come back in the broadcast and share a question, you're in the screen. Uh, so just unmute that mic and you're good to go. Hey, Yusuf. Hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> good. Um, so um, my question was, do you have a grown-up hermit crab? Because there's a hermit crab that's uh, really big. All right, well, that is an awesome question. I'll give you a look at our largest hermit crabs. They are right over in this tank. So if we look at our touch tanks, we do have our small little hermit crabs. So that guy is pretty small. And our largest or most full grown hermit crab would be over here in this tank. So these kind of larger ones right here, this would be about the biggest that we have them here in our waters in Petty Harbor and here in the aquarium. He's, of course, hiding away in a shell right now. But that's pretty much as large as we see them here at the mini aquarium. Awesome. Great question, Yusuf. All right. Uh, Miss Creamer's class, St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, they have a whole ton of questions. They want to know if the species in our water, so water off New Brunswick, water off Newfoundland, do they migrate for the winter? This is something that we deal with on land animals a lot. Are there migrations in the ocean? 
So yeah, a lot of animals actually do migrate with the seasons, including things like whales. So they'll actually migrate, they'll have their feeding season. So there's a, a time during the year that all they're doing is feeding and building up their energy. And then they actually migrate to colder or warmer waters. Um, things like crabs and lobsters do that as well. They migrate vertically though. So they don't exactly go um, distances that we're familiar with here on land. They actually either go more shallow or deeper depending on the season. So yeah, they do migrate. Yeah. I love that you mentioned the vertical migration. So honestly, people should look this up too. Vertical migration. So all the creatures that live way down low, they sort of avoid the predators at the surface during the day and at night they come up is far and away the largest migration on earth by huge orders of magnitude. It's so amazing to think of the billions and billions, if not trillions of animals that come up every single night. So great question, guys. All right, Miss Kingston's class, we're coming back to you guys, Mary Mitchie. Uh, unmute that mic, you're good to go. And then we'll head to St. John Catholic in a minute for another. Hey, Brother. <laughs> Hi, guys. Go ahead, Robbie. What's your biggest animal in the aquarium? So right now, our biggest animal in the aquarium would probably be, we actually have a very, very large lobster, but he is hiding away in his den at the moment. But if you can look very closely, you can see his claws. So this lobster was found in Petty Harbor earlier this summer, and it's estimated 15 to 20 pounds. He's a massive lobster, and that would make him anywhere from 70 to 100 years old, we're guessing, because some of the largest lobsters that are found, um, they can be over 100 years old. So lobsters don't exactly age like we do. And the only way that we could really know how old the lobster is, is to actually dissect its eye stalk. So we're not going to do that, of course. <laughs> so we just have to guess how old that lobster is. And um, so we're guessing it's anywhere from 70 to 100. Could be 50, could be 70, could be 100. We're not quite sure. I love, I find it really fascinating. I've truly never heard about the eye stalk thing before. What a neat way of finding out an animal age. How awesome. Um, Mr. Roseglass, they're joining us in Ottawa, Queen Elizabeth Public School. Jacob wants to know, simple follow-up question, how many animals do you have in the aquarium? That is a good question. So we have quite a few animals. So in this tank right here, we have two animals. And we have around 22 tanks, I believe, this year. With us being a catch and release aquarium, it's changing all the time. Oh, he's going to give us a yawn. Maybe. Oh. That's our ocean pout. <laughs> and there's actually two of them in there. Yep, yeah, maybe giving us a yawn there. So, and we have a bunch of anemones. So it's actually really, really hard to answer the question how many we have because a lot of them are really, really small. Um, some of them actually come in with the water. So remember how I said that we have a flow through system, all of the water is coming in constantly. Sometimes we do have small planktonic animals come in with the water and settle into the tanks. And where things are changing all the time, we get new animals in, we release animals. It's kind of because of that model, it's kind of hard to know how many we have at any given moment. <laughs> Great answer. All right, we've got time for three more questions. Time flies and you're having fun, people. Thank you, Catholic. Come on back up in Perth. If you guys have one more for us, just unmute that mic and you're good to go. How can we help stop this from getting worse? Excellent question. Good that question. is an awesome question. Yeah, so like I said, it's tied into how much carbon dioxide is out there in the atmosphere. So things by like cutting down on your carbon dioxide use or, you know, the emissions that you personally make from your car or um, the production in your house and things like that and energy in general. Um, and also planting trees to absorb up that carbon as well. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, even if you were to, let's say, Google, what can you do to minimize your carbon footprint or help with climate change? It's all the same issue. Um, so there's a lot of resources online to, if you're really keen on looking at all these different ways, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add, just because it's very salient today, is vote. I know a lot of you students are under the voting age, but we all just had a, a major election across Canada. Uh, one positive note, regardless of your political uh, inclinations ahead of time, is the Liberals who just got elected back in. Uh, a lot of the top climate scientists in the world did a study of all the climate plans put forth by the political parties and ranked theirs to be truly excellent. So with hundreds of thousands of kids marching around the world on behalf of climate, you guys are the most engaged generation ever, bar none. Uh, and you really know the facts and you're doing positive stuff, 
I think that's a really heartening sign. So as you get older, vote for parties that take priority and, and think about these things in a serious and meaningful way because that'll be the biggest way that you can make a difference outside of the individual actions you can do as a person or as a family. All right, we've got time for two more questions. Yusuf, I'm going to come back to you and then we'll wrap up with one from a YouTube group before ending our broadcast. Yusuf, come on in. Um, has there been any effects on acidic of acidic water on jellyfish? On jellyfish. So that is a really good question. So we'll come over right back to our anemone because anemones are actually like upside down jellyfish. So they have their tentacles on the top instead of the bottom and they just stick on to the bottom. And because they are so um, soft, like they don't have that hard shell necessarily, um, but it affects everything in the ocean because kind of like when it gets really, really cold outside, we're a little bit more sluggish and we don't want to go anywhere. We're just going to bundle up in blankets. The animals will also adapt to their environment. So if it's becoming, if the pH is changing, they have to change their processes, how they work in order to, um, to regulate themselves. So these anemones, like I said, they're affected by, because of the clownfish um, and the jellyfish, they're also affected because of um, the pH in the water as well. It's very similar. Great question, guys. I'm going to ask this question for a shameless reason. It's because I want to tell a little bit of the story beforehand. So the question from Ms. Kramer's class is about if you guys have sea cucumbers, which we'll get to in just a second. Just look up sea cucumbers when you've done this broadcast. I've got you looking up a lot at this point. So when we get cut, we can get a scab, we can heal. Sea cucumbers have some sorts of parasites sometimes that literally eat their organs every single day and regrow the organs. So imagine you could regrow like a liver or a kidney uh, every single day. Some sea cucumbers can do that. They're very, very cool animals. And with that, Holly, do you guys have them there at the aquarium? We do. So there is a sea cucumber right there, right next to our starfish. There's another one right up there. This little fish, that's a little sculpin. We, we do have quite a few sea cucumbers hanging out in this tank right here. Nice. Very, very cool. Tomorrow we're going to Whitley's Aquarium in Canada in their coral tank, and we have some there as well. So a lot of aquaria have sea cucumbers. They can be easier to care for than a lot of the more, I guess, complex animals like bigger fish. So glad we got that question, guys. Holly, this has been so, so much fun. What I want to do before coming back to you to do a wrap up in just a second is to highlight again this Week of Wonder Festival. We are doing this for Science Literacy Week across Canada, Canada's largest science festival. We're doing it in conjunction with the Canadian Association of Science Centers, such an incredible group highlighting the incredible places coast to coast that are working to bring you science and exploration in nature every single day, most of which are open right now. And if you want to learn more about the Mini Aquarium, check out miniaqua.org. And if you particularly want to see their virtual program offerings, so like most groups during COVID, they dove in with some really amazing virtual programs like you had the chance to see today, check out miniaqua.org slash phma hyphen online. Check that out. You'll see all the other stuff that they got a chance to do and keep the learning going after we're done. All right, Holly, before we wrap up the day, uh, is there one last message you want kids to take away about uh, ocean acidification, about your opinion, and you can leave them with? Hang on, I'm just trying to flip my camera around there. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Um, so just as a closing message, it's just really, really exciting for me to be able to talk about ocean acidification because not a whole lot of people are really familiar with it. So if you guys wanted to go online and see what things you can do to help change acidification or learn more, we're all learning more. Even the you know brightest scientific minds in the world are still learning more about ocean acidification. Fantastic. What a great message. And again, I always like to highlight the fact that science is an ever-growing process. You guys can contribute to that, make the world a better place, learn more about what's going on and see how you can work to help change it. Again, St. John Catholic, you guys asked that question, what can we do? And that is the biggest question we get at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for all our programs. So kudos to you for, for sharing that. I hope you guys can take action now that you're done the broadcast. Now, Holly, what we do at the end of every session for our classes too, is I'm going to bring in our classes, Yusuf, Miss Kingston, uh, and our, our St. John Catholic crew. If you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell to Holly, you are all in. Unmute your mics. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.